In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And since the dawn of creation, God's attributes are seen and known by all. As a building requires a builder, creation demands a creator. And as an outstanding design points to a gifted designer, our amazing universe reveals the glory of an awesome creator. God's wonders surround us and these marvels reveal much about our Creator. Through creation we glimpse His power and wisdom, His majesty and care. Creation is speaking to those who will listen. I'm Dr. John Whitcomb. Join us now as we explore the message of creation, conscience, and the glory of God. Throughout creation, God's power is displayed. From the new growth of plants in the spring, to new life forming in the womb. Wherever we turn, the Creator's energizing power is unmistakable. He guides the stars in their courses above. 
be formed the majestic mountains. He maintains the beneficial seasons. And in his hand is the life of every living thing. You know, the fact that we have a universe tells us that, that we need a, a creator. Because you see, the universe has a beginning and therefore requires a cause. The energy in the universe has a beginning and therefore requires a cause. And people say, well, you know, if, okay, fine, God made the universe, but then who made God? But you see, God is eternal. God doesn't have a beginning and therefore doesn't require a cause. And that may be a little hard to grasp, but there's nothing irrational about an eternal being. There is something irrational about something popping into existence from nothing, because that violates causality. You know, a famous evolutionist was once asked, you know, where did the Big Bang come from? And he said simply, you know, if somebody ever asks you where mass energy came from, just ask them where God came from. And I think he really uh, said something much more meaningful than he thought. Something had to be eternal. Either mass energy is eternal or God is eternal. Well, science has taught us a lot about mass energy. One of the things is it wears out. Mass energy eternal doesn't make any sense at all. God is eternal it does make sense. As we read in that first chapter of Hebrews, the heavens, the whole universe is growing old and wearing out like a garment to be cast off, but thou, O Lord, endureth forever. The Bible explains there's one God who's the creator and the source of all life and energy. The forces of nature are energized and guided by his hand. Who hasn't felt the rumble of an approaching storm and considered God's might? Thunderstorms are an amazing display of the Creator's might. An average thunderstorm pours down several hundred million gallons of water, equivalent to the amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls every six minutes. The same storm releases 10 million kilowatt hours of energy, equivalent to a 20 kiloton nuclear warhead. And large, severe thunderstorms can be 10 or even 100 times more energetic. At any given moment, hundreds of storms are occurring somewhere around the world. This amounts to about 16 million thunderstorms each year. The accompanying lightning illuminates an entire skyline. A bolt may reach over five miles in length, contain over 100 million electrical volts, and soar to temperatures approaching 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit in a split second. Hotter than the surface of the sun. On average, lightning strikes the Earth 100 times every second. Several million bolts reach Earth each day. The tremendous power, the incredible speed, and the glaring flash are clear manifestations of our Creator's majestic power. Thunderstorms are an incredible phenomenon in the atmosphere. They're awesome, they're powerful, they're frightening. They have all kinds of energy releases. That's basically what's happening is a thunderstorm is releasing large quantities of energy in our atmosphere by vertical motions. Thunderstorms contribute a major amount to the water cycle. The hydrologic cycle, water is evaporated from the oceans, it's, the vapors drifted over the continents, and then it falls as rain, and then flows back into the sea. Thunderstorms are a major part of that cycle where it converts that water vapor back into a liquid water or rain falls to the earth. Lightning and uh, thunderstorms in scripture are often used as a symbol of God's wrath against rebellious people. But everybody, 
has been struck by the awesome beauty of lightning and storm and the smell of the fresh air. Uh, the lightning itself uh, puts together two gases in the air, nitrogen and hydrogen, to make fertilizer. When the lightning stroke goes through the air, it uh, releases the nitrogen in the vapor form and, and absorbs it into the water and it falls down and fertilizes the ground. So our crops are fertilized by the nitrogen produced by thunderstorms. 4,000 years ago, Job pondered the Almighty's display with these words. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He stirs up the sea with his power, and by his understanding he breaks up the storm. Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways, and how small a whisper we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? So thunderstorms and natural events that are highly energetic, I think they, they're a lesson about if God can do this, what must he be like? While we may not fully grasp this cumulative power, these grand displays should cause all to stand in awe of our great God. energy output enormous. The core of the Sun is a scorching 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Though the Sun is 93 million miles from Earth, sunlight is our main source of energy. Energy leaves the Sun at the ferocious rate of 5 million tons of matter per second. This goes on day and night, year after year. There are many examples of God's power in nature. The whole universe came about by His Word. Psalm 33, 9 says that God spoke and it was finished. He commanded and it stood fast. As one good example, consider our nearest star, the Sun. The Sun gives off more energy in one second than mankind has produced since Adam and Eve. The sun actually provides its energy by nuclear fusion, converting hydrogen into helium on a grand scale. And uh, this is true of all the stars. In our own Milky Way galaxy, we estimate 100 billion stars. And beyond that, in deep space, we see 100 billion more galaxies. One cannot begin to grasp the kind of energy and power that we're talking about, all created by God's Word. The sun heats the earth and it drives all of the weather systems on the earth. Tornadoes, hurricanes, thunderstorms, just plain rain clouds, winds, all of that is driven by the energy coming from the sun. And the energy that we have on earth is only one billionth of the amount of energy that's coming from the sun. To gain perspective, with the aid of computer animation, let's now travel with the Earth to the Sun at 100 times the speed of light. From this view, we begin to appreciate the magnitude of our home star. Over one million Earths would fit inside the Sun. Yet our Sun is an average-sized star. Many stars in our own galaxy dwarf it. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the night sky. Though 200 trillion miles away, this orange giant is visible to the naked eye. By moving our sun next to Arcturus, we can grasp its immensity. Arcturus is 100 times brighter, with a radius 20 times greater than the sun's. Yet even Arcturus appears small when compared with the supergiant Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse has a radius 600 times that of our sun. A reddish star, it shines a remarkable 60,000 times brighter than the sun. 
However, even Betelgeuse is not the largest star in our galaxy. Several red supergiants in the Milky Way are even larger. Some with a radius 1,500 times that of our sun. Well, one of the things in creation that I think really exhibits God's power is the power released in stars. Uh, the sun, it releases more energy in, in one second than a billion major cities on the earth, if there were a billion, would produce in a year. And that's just released in one second. You can imagine that. And of course, there are stars that are even more powerful than the sun. And just imagine all that power. All those stars, billions of stars in our own galaxy, billions of stars in other galaxies. And yet the Bible describes the creation of all that energy, all that power with the single phrase, he made the stars also. When we consider that these ratios present only a sliver of our Creator's power, certainly we can agree with the psalmist when he exhorts, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Of course, the stars reveal more than raw power. Without the light of the sun, all life on earth would soon perish. The sun's life-giving energy provides a constant reminder of our Creator's steadfast love, the God who shines His gift of light on all. The visible universe contains more than 100 billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies has a diameter millions of trillions of miles wide, and each contains hundreds of billions of stars. Though incomprehensible, it is now estimated that the universe holds over a billion trillion stars. Long before the introduction of the telescope, Scripture declared that man would be unable to determine the exact number because there are so many. Of course, the Creator knows the exact number, and Psalm 147 declares that He even calls each star by name. The power to create each of these stars, the wisdom to maintain their stellar courses, and the incredible beauty displayed throughout the universe combine to affirm the Creator's majesty and care. God has made the universe so vast. All man can do is just marvel at this universe, the vastness of it. And I say, God, you are so, you are so great. And I think of what David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have made, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you should visit him? It's estimated that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Which the Bible tells us that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways above our ways and His thoughts above our thoughts. So chew on that for a little bit. Think about how big the universe is compared to the earth, which is just uh, the head of a pin by comparison. Just how big is God's universe? Traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, we could circle the Earth seven times in one second. However, to travel across the known universe at the speed of light would take 28 billion years or more. Today, most astronomers acknowledge that the universe appears to be expanding. This also agrees with the Bible, which says God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. There are some examples in the Bible of scientific foresight. One example that comes to mind in particular is in Isaiah 40, 22, which talks about God stretching out the heavens as a tent or as a curtain. And you might say, well, that, you know, that is written in a poetic way, so we've got to be careful. And yet there are at least 10 other places in the Bible where it talks about this, this stretching out of the heavens. And that's something that uh, was only discovered in the uh, 20th century when we found that indeed all the galaxies appear to be, or virtually all of them, appear to be moving away from each other as if the entire universe is being, lo and behold, stretched out and expanded, just like the Bible says. And that's obviously not something that, that people could have observed in ancient times. That's something that had to have been revealed to them from above. Unimaginably large, containing spectacular galaxies, 
and stunning nebulae. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. It's not just the visible forces of nature or our immense universe that reveals God's might. It turns out that there is tremendous energy present in all matter, even the tiny atom. Let's explore one more example of the Creator's infinite power. In the last century, scientists have uncovered the vast energy present in all matter. The now well-known relation E equals mc squared states that the potential energy of any matter is equal to its mass times the speed of light squared. Well, one of the uh, great discoveries of the 20th century was the discovery E equals mc squared, that little equation that most people have heard of, but maybe they don't know what it means. What it really means is that energy has mass. It doesn't mean that energy can be exchanged for mass, but rather energy actually possesses mass. Energy weighs something, if you could put it on a scale, even light, even the light that's coming from this, this room, if I could put it on a scale, it would weigh uh, just a little bit. In the past century, scientists have explored the concept of nuclear energy. It involves the formula E equals mc squared, made famous by Albert Einstein. In this formula, the m stands for mass or matter, and c is the speed of light. What the expression says is that it is possible to take matter or mass and convert it entirely into energy. You take a mass and you annihilate it and off comes light and sound and power and energy. And that also means that if we could take just a little bit of mass and harness the energy from it, uh, we, could, we could do some really incredible things. You see that equation, the C in that equation e equals mc squared. C is the speed of light, which of course is, is quite large and uh, c squared, the speed of light times itself, that's very, very large. So that tells us that even the tiniest amount of mass has an enormous amount of energy associated with it. To appreciate the tremendous energy within any mass, consider that nuclear reactors convert only a tiny fraction of the total mass of their fuel to energy. If, however, we were able to convert all the mass to energy, the resultant output would be enormous. For example, if the mass of an average-sized tree could be converted into energy, the power yield would be 45 trillion kilowatt-hours. By way of comparison, the U.S. generates about 4 trillion kilowatt-hours of electrical energy per year. So if just a single tree's mass was converted into energy, and that energy harnessed, it would provide the entire United States with over 10 years of electrical energy. Or, to illustrate further, the potential energy within a single grain of salt could power an entire household for several months. Though scientists have much to learn about energy, mass, and what holds matter together, they have discovered that the energy residing in all matter is incomprehensibly vast. Scripture explains that it is the Lord Himself who is upholding all things by the word of His power. This includes every atom, every cell, every star, and the entire universe. It is now undeniable that the Almighty has created a universe with unlimited energy. There had to be someone, not something, because things were out, second law of thermodynamics. There had to be someone, without beginning or end, who had the power and the knowledge, the wisdom, the incredible, infinite intelligence to put all this together from the atom, the organization of the atom, to the cosmos, and so forth. When we look at the many examples of God's power, it should invoke a sense of reverence and awe in our hearts. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Therefore, the proper response to God's authority is to worship Him and seek His mercy and forgiveness for our sins. The prophet Jeremiah declared, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Surely creation reveals God's omnipotence, but there's much more. Though the universe is marred by the curse, the Creator's wisdom 
beauty and love are still evident. Wherever we turn, the Lord's wisdom is conspicuous. Study the properties of water. This elegant molecule is indispensable to life. So our generous God covered four-fifths of the earth's surface with it in streams, lakes, and seas. Water is perfectly designed to support the life of every cell and creature. It's an excellent solvent, coolant, and transporter. Or examine the insect world. Each of these amazing creatures is endowed with ingenious abilities that far surpass anything man-made. From elegant to complex, the Creator's works declare His wisdom. Thousands of years ago, God asked Job, Have you entered the treasury of snow? Now, no man living at that time could have known fully about the treasures of the snow. But with the advent of the microscope, these elaborate crystals can now be wholly appreciated. These are actual snow crystals that have reached Earth intact. Snow crystals form in the clouds where water vapor condenses and crystallizes into ice. As the crystals grow, these remarkable patterns emerge. Complex, symmetrical, and beautiful. They are breathtaking to behold. In contrast, Man-made snow has none of the elaborate structure found in snow crystals. Snow crystals are made out of amazing water molecules. Each oxygen atom has a little bit of negative charge, and it holds on to two hydrogen atoms that have a little positive charge, and it holds them 104 and a half degrees apart. When you reach the freezing point, suddenly they reach a point where the electrical attraction of plus and minus charges can pull them together. That's the energy source. And then that shape God gave the water molecules, they line up to form those beautiful uh, crystals, each one unique, each one a reflection of God's creativity. Every day, trillions of God's transparent treasures fall to earth for our discovery and joy. And yet, no two are exactly alike. I believe that God built this hexagonal shape into the individual water molecule because of the way they have to fit together they form this hexagonal shape as they add on molecules and grow outward. And each individual ice crystal is made up of literally millions of water molecules. And although they fit together in a particular way, as they grow outward, the ice crystals falling down through the cloud at different temperatures, they begin to get different shapes. So every ice crystal is going to be slightly different than every other one. Each crystal is built on a hexagonal pattern and exhibits a marvelous symmetry of design. Truly, there is a treasury of snow, just as God declared 4,000 years ago. There's two things about ice crystals that just really excite me. One is literally the beauty. You look at them and you see all these patterns with these flat faces and the, and the, the structure that's there. There's over a hundred different basic types of ice crystals. It's just the beauty of it. And that tells me something about God. It tells me that God loves beauty 
And he loves me because he provided this beauty to look at. So it resonates with me. The other is the way in which the ice crystals are ordered, the way in which the individual molecules fit together. That fits a particular consistent pattern time and time again, tells me that God has designed it. There is also a spiritual application. As each snow crystal is distinctly patterned, so each human, each soul is unique and of special concern to our Lord. As God's creative hand forms ice crystals with loving care, so too he intends to form each person to reflect his glory. Compared to the rest of creation, snow crystals are simple, yet the great architect's attention, even to the countless snow crystals he forms each day, is an unmistakable mark of his care. God has built into not only ice crystals, all kinds of other molecules, all kinds of systems, relationships and processes that we don't even begin to fathom yet today. That's one of the reasons I'm a scientist. I love trying to find out how things function, how they operate, and apply mathematical equations to them because I feel like I'm touching the face of God, if you wish. If simple water molecules that form ice crystals exhibit magnificent structure, consider the design ingenuity behind large, complex molecules, such as DNA. DNA contains the blueprint for all life and is by far the densest information storage mechanism known in the universe. For example, the amount of information contained in a pinhead volume of DNA would fill a stack of books 500 times higher than from here to the moon. The program code and design of such an incredible system indicates a supremely intelligent designer. The evidence to me that just cries out that there's a God is the study of DNA. DNA is a very powerful, massive information storage system. In fact, DNA that makes up our genes actually is like books of information that's read by a language system. It's absolutely phenomenal. And scientists know today that language as a code only come from an intelligence, and information only comes from information. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to a code. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to information. And as you look at DNA, it actually cries out in the beginning, God created the universe. We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the, the instruction manual. It's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of 100 trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means. God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule, repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. There are many examples in creation of, of things that demonstrate the biblical God. Uh, one would be in our very DNA. Our DNA has information in it. And there is a whole field of scientific study called information science, which studies how information originates, how it's transmitted, and so on. And one of the laws of information science says that information never originates by itself 
in matter, never spontaneously comes about. Any time we trace uh, the copying of information back to its source, it always, it always comes back to a mind. And since we have creative information in DNA, that tells me that DNA comes from intelligence. It's not something that could possibly come about through millions of years of mutations and natural selection. That just won't work. Yet even the DNA molecule is simple compared to cells. All life consists of cells, and each cell functions as a miniature city. When we consider that a human body consists of trillions of cells working together as one unit, we should be in humble awe of our Creator's intimate care and perfect wisdom. Every seed is a miniature miracle. God has programmed the tiny sequoia seed to become the largest tree on earth, reaching nearly 300 feet tall and weighing many tons. God has designed the humble apple seed to yield a bounty of delicious fruit for years to come. And God has planned a multitude of seeds to produce spectacular blossoms in abundance. Consider the many varieties of seeds. As stated in Genesis, each seed always produces after its own kind. And just as the Lord intended, the fruits and byproducts that they bear have supplied the needed food and resources for man and his environment. In the first chapter of Genesis, God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. So the Creator made life with the ability to reproduce after its kind. Plants produce seed. This answers the question, which came first, the seed or the plant? Clearly, God created plant life with the seed in itself. Seeds are masterpieces of micro-miniaturization. <laughs> Inside each seed is a little baby, a little embryonic plant. It's already got leaves, you know, and a stem and a root. It's surrounded by a seed coat that protects it and filled with all kinds of receptors listening in to environmental signals so it knows what temperature, what moisture conditions, how much oxygen. All these things have to be present before it will sprout. And the first seeds we find as fossils look just like the seeds that we have today. The seed is the first reproductive structure God made on creation day three, and it's the way living things ever since have multiplied after kind. Today, scientists have discovered what Scripture stated all along. Inside the unassuming seed is life itself. Contained within are living cells, tiny factories of amazing complexity. No scientist has been able to build a synthetic seed, and no seed is simple. Seeds are programmed to remain dormant until water and warmth are available. Who installed this ability to monitor temperature and humidity? Who determined the proper time for the seed to germinate? Who told the root, you must go down, and the stem, you must head upward? Do you see the guiding hand of our all-loving Creator? In order to sprout and thrive, seeds require the proper soil nutrients, the ideal properties found in water, the correct frequency spectrum of light, the right atmosphere, and the necessary pollinators. All of these must have been in place from the beginning in order for seeds to yield a harvest of blessings for mankind. What a drab world it would be without flowering plants. From unassuming seed to magnificent blossom, flowers reflect a sliver of God's splendor. 
there are a great variety of flowering plants flourishing all over the globe and each with its own unique flower, fruit and fragrance. As a blossom expands, its fragrance fills the air. Consider that each flower always produces its own particular perfume. Even more amazing, God uses the same elements, soil, light and water, to produce all these brilliant varieties. Remarkably, certain flowers are designed to know what time it is. California poppies, morning glories and daylilies are three beautiful examples. Opening and closing with clock-like precision, they are sensitive to atmospheric pressure, length of daylight, temperature and humidity, and must therefore have built-in biorhythms. Each leaf of a plant is also a marvel. Long before man discovered how to harness solar power, the Creator installed miniature solar panels in every green leaf. As the leaf expands, it is programmed to face the sun to receive its energy. This energy powers its chemical factories. As a result, carbon dioxide is absorbed, oxygen is released, and hydrogen is used in making sugars. How ingenious of our God to design leaves to absorb man's waste gas and release the oxygen which every creature needs for survival. Photosynthesis is also the basis for all our food supply. Thankfully, countless numbers of God's little green machines perform this service every day. Flowering plants are such a testimony to God's provision. Not only are they critical in terms of providing food and medicine and various other aspects of life as we know it, but we would simply not be able to exist without the flowering plants. Well, that ties in with the large group of animals called the arthropods. One of the groups of arthropods would be the insects. Insects need the plants, and plants most assuredly need the insects in terms of pollination, in terms of keeping the plants fertilized on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, Genesis 2.9 tells us that God created uh, green plants pleasant to the sight and good for food. Uh, plants use the amazing process of photosynthesis to trap energy from the sun, to put together carbon dioxide molecules from the air, water molecules from the soil, uh, to make sugar molecules a basic uh, building block for all of the other food groups. Where do the plants get the carbon dioxide? We breathe it out. Animals breathe out the carbon dioxide. Plants absorb that carbon dioxide. Uh, they absorb the water. They release oxygen from the water molecules so we can breathe it in, burn the sugar to produce the carbon dioxide that they can absorb to make more sugar. You may get the idea all of these parts have to fit together at the same time. That's one thing as we look at the creation account, how God made plants, animals, people, all the physical features of the universe to fit together in an intricate pattern reflecting His glory. Food, oxygen, medicine, fuel, raw materials. Surely the Lord designed plants for our benefit. The rich diversity of flowering plants and the many purposes they serve all point to a wise and compassionate Creator. Though magnificent in bloom, the glory of the flower quickly fades. Scripture likens man's life on earth to a flower, so quick to pass away. Therefore, how important it is for each of us to seek everlasting life today. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth. So God created every living thing that moves, and God saw that it was good. In the book of Genesis, we read that God created everything to be very good. And though sin has since injured creation, the fish, the birds, and all creatures still testify to God's goodness and wisdom. We'll now turn our attention to the Lord's incredible creatures. Living in the waters of the world are creatures more magnificent than mankind could ever imagine. The enormous assortment of ocean dwellers speaks of the unlimited ingenuity of our great Creator. 
and each sea creature has been designed with remarkable functionality. God equipped the octopus with a form of jet propulsion, suction cup technology, and self-adjusting camouflage far superior to any man-made design. Watch as this giant octopus morphs into a rock with algae. Its color, shape, and texture are all transformed in an instant. The squid on the left is a male. He shows a brownish-red courtship pattern toward the female, while simultaneously showing a white fighting pattern on his opposite side to ward off rival males. As he switches sides, his markings actually flip. Dual simultaneous signaling demonstrates God's engineering supremacy. Underwater symbiotic relationships reveal perfect foresight in design planning. Sea anemones are poisonous, yet God has enabled certain fish to safely cohabitate in their environment. For example, clownfish are designed with an immunity to the anemone's poison. This could not have been inherited, as prior generations would have been killed and gone extinct before evolving a beneficial immunity. The schooling pattern of certain fish is still being researched. The ability for fish to dart with synchronized movements reveals the guiding hand of a grand conductor. Different species of fish have been relegated to dwell at specific levels of the ocean depths. This capability is the result of a specially designed air bladder, which secretes gases from the bloodstream, regulating the pressure maintaining equilibrium, allowing the fish to survive at various water pressures within a range determined by the creator. One of my absolutely favorite sea creatures is the pearly nautilus or the chambered nautilus. Here's a shell like you might find in a Florida shell shop and when you cut these down the middle, woo, look at that, all these little chambers inside. Uh, the animal that lives in the last chamber here is essentially a squid. It has lots of little tentacles coming out the front like that. All these little chambers enable it to regulate its buoyancy like a submarine does. Inside that amazing squid, uh, there's a brain. There's an eye that sees the world like we do. Uh, there's a digestive system with salivary glands and a pancreas gland. They have three different hearts. They're as complex inside as we are. And yet, uh, fossils of this kind of creature are among the first to be found. Initial complexity, a marvelous testimony to God's creativity. When I look at the sea creatures that God has created, I look in particular to the fish. They are amazing creatures, starting with their streamlined efficiency, the fact that they are designed to extract oxygen from the water in such an efficient manner, the fact that they have such a pleasing aesthetic values, and also, of course, the great quantities of food they provide for man. Fish have always been fish, according to the fossil record, Yes, fish certainly are an incredible feature of God's living creation. The obvious sophistication, variety, and beauty of sea creatures shout out a master artist created all things for his good pleasure. Birds are among the most captivating creatures on Earth. We marvel at their spectacular colors, their streamlined shapes, and their ability to fly with grace and ease. For centuries, man attempted to imitate the flight of a bird. 
It was only in the 20th century that he succeeded in controlled flight. To this day, in order to improve the aerodynamics of the plane, man will return to study God's marvelous avian design. Consider some of the Creator's design features. A bird's bones are lightweight and virtually hollow. They're supported inside by struts and honeycombed with air sacs. These lightweight bones are designed so efficiently for flight that the bird's feathers usually weigh more than its entire skeleton. Even its beak is designed to save weight, made of lightweight horn rather than heavy bone. Birds also have two strong sets of breast muscles, a large set to control the wing's downstrokes and a smaller set to control the upstrokes. And only birds have been created with feathers. Feathers insulate the bird from the sun's heat, protect it from the cold, waterproof the body, and create wing and tail surfaces necessary for flight. Each feather is connected to a nerve and controlled by a muscle. This precision muscular control helps the bird balance in the air, steer, and brake when slowing down to land. Birds, they're just truly spectacularly amazing. Uh, they're well known, of course, for the feather, which is a masterpiece of strength and lightness combined in one thing. They have a uh, little system of barbs, barbules, kind of like hooks and eyelets and Velcro that can zipper together uh, the little feathers that stick out from the main shaft. And they can take their bill and zipper them and unzipper them as they oil their feathers. And each feather along the length of the wing uh, has a slightly different size and shape that's coordinated with all of the others. There's no way <laughs> at all <laughs> feathers could just arise by time and chance. They are marvels, masterpieces, miraculous examples of creation. Another essential element to bird flight is the air-filled bags that lie between the bird's organs. The bird's air sacs are connected to its lungs and during flight air flows through them. This arrangement rapidly feeds the bird's body tissues with life-supporting oxygen while keeping it light in the air. All birds are amazing. You know, they have a, a, a system of breathing that's not found in any other creature. The bird lung uh, is a special double tied system where you can oxygenate air both inhaling and exhaling. Unlike our lungs or the lungs of any other creature, the bird lung has back doors. And it turns out that this is important. Birds do not change the shape of their chest cavity when they breathe. You know, if you saw a bird just land from a thousand mile migration, just, just landed, would you see the chest heave as he breathed? They are stone still, no matter how hard they've been flying, you think, how do they breathe? Turns out that the air is moved through the bird much like a bellows for a fire. These air bags between the muscles, as the bird flies, as it walks, it's, it's moving the air. Such wonderful creatures God made in birds. All of these engineering marvels combine for efficient flight and show perfect foresight in the creation of birds. One of the uh, marvels of birds is their ability to migrate long distances. The Arctic Turn makes it all the way from areas near the North Pole all the way down to the South Pole and back uh, every year. Now, now people can do that in, in an airplane, but you've perhaps looked into the cockpit of an airplane, all those switches and dials and levers and controls, and then you have to have ground control to tell the pilot where he's going, and all of that is packed into one teeny part of a bird's brain. Next time somebody calls you a bird brain, say why, thank you. The Lord has equipped each bird uniquely for his role in life. In the service of man, each species of bird has a special area of patrol. Many help by controlling insects. Others remove the carcasses. The finch family is a great weed seed destroyer. The owl and the hawk keep the rodents in check. 
The sandpiper combs the beaches. The water bird maintains the proper balance in fish population. The heron in frog and snake control. With graceful proportions, amazing aerodynamic abilities, and practical functions, each bird is a testimony to God's wisdom and love. While God provides marvelously for birds, remember that Jesus assures us that we are of more value than many sparrows. The hummingbird is a marvel of agility and grace. The smallest birds, they take their name from the humming sound made by their rapid wing beats. Darting from flower to flower, the hummer poises in midair. He has come to sip sweet nectar. The hummingbird has been wonderfully designed to do this. God gave it a small body to move with ease about the flowers a long, needle-like bill to probe deeply into the flower cup, and a specialized tongue ideal for extracting nectar. God also gave it remarkably strong wings and a sturdy breastbone, which enabled the bird to stop in mid-air and even fly backwards and sideways with ease. Of course, all the hummingbird's features, long bill, special tongue, unique rapid wing beat, would have to work together from the beginning in order for it to be able to gather its energy food and thereby survive. Though the wings of most birds bend at the shoulder, elbow, and wrist, the hummingbird chiefly uses the shoulder. Like a helicopter, it can rise directly upward. The creator's design, however, makes it possible to swivel in all directions is much more efficient and far more agile than any man-made flying machine. The Hummer's capabilities are phenomenal. When hovering, his wings beat 50 times a second. When speeding straight away, up to 80 times. Its heart beats 21 times in the same second. These tiny little birds have a metabolic rate that just is almost unimaginable. Their heartbeat is so fast it gets into the range of audible sound. Uh, you think of these little hummers that fly, they, they migrate over hundreds of miles. The reserve of food to make this trip, uh, an error of uh, hundreds of a gram <laughs> in nutrients could mean not making the trip. Uh, birds alone would be absolute compelling evidence for a marvelous creator. The hummingbird's nest is a masterpiece of art. The female is the artist. She uses fern fuzz dandelion seed down and other plant felts. The exterior is adorned with lichens and fastened with spider webbing. The interior is lined with the softest down available. No one teaches her the art of nest building. It is a God-given ability. The male hummingbird's coloring has no rival in the bird kingdom. The magnificent hummingbird, the broad-tailed, the blue-throated, and Costa's hummingbird are among the more than 300 stunning species. The iridescent colors of the throat and crown are due to refraction and not pigments. Often, these areas appear dark, almost black, but from the proper angle, the iridescent colors seem to glow from within.
Every aspect of these remarkable birds testifies to the Creator's gracious provision. Would we say that the hummingbird has been especially favored by the all-loving Creator? No, this genuine love is extended upon every creature. If we carefully study any creature, the Lord's glory will always beam forth. An estimated 18,000 butterfly species adorn our planet. The beautiful coloration of butterfly wings is created by millions of minute scales. These precision scales function as biophotonic crystals, reflecting specific wavelengths of light to produce these brilliant colors. The extraordinary patterns and pleasing colors reveal a wise and caring designer. One of the amazing things I find about the butterfly is its beautiful iridescence. Take for example the morpho butterfly. Morpho butterflies have a beautiful blue type iridescence. But then when biologists many decades ago began to look at the scales of the butterfly, they didn't find any pigmentation cells. They found instead biophotonic structures. They found structures that are designed by the Creator to absorb certain wavelengths of white light and reflect back to the viewer only that wavelength of light within the spectrum of a bluish purple color. We have found that using electron microscope, there are structures there that can have no more variation than 0 0.00004 millimeters. A wonderful testament to God's design. All butterflies undergo an amazing transformation during their life cycle. The insect begins as an egg, then a crawling caterpillar, followed by the pupa stage. During this stage, the caterpillar begins to convulse in rhythmic jerks breaking off its outer skin. Its legs and head capsule are quickly shed, giving rise to a chrysalis. Then, within the first day, the caterpillar's organs disintegrate into a soupy liquid. Miraculously, after one to two weeks, a complex winged butterfly emerges. This metamorphosis takes place in a matter of days not millions of years. The adult butterfly now has six segmented legs, antennae, a specialized feeding tube, two amazing compound eyes, complex reproductive organs, and four ornate wings. The caterpillar had none of these features. Clearly the genetic instructions for all these stages were programmed into the insect by the Creator from the beginning. When the butterfly changes from a caterpillar to a chrysalis to a butterfly, there are two completely different designs here. One design is for the caterpillar, that's the initial stage, and all that does is creep around on the backside of a leaf and it munches and eats all day, increases its size about 250 times, that's all it does. But then it goes into the chrysalid, it turns into liquid, and then it comes out with a totally different design. What was the butterfly designed to do? Well, that was designed to fly, of course, where the caterpillar wasn't. It was designed to uh, drink the nectar from the flowers, but at the same time fertilize the flowers. It was designed to mate, and it was designed to be able to migrate from one country to the other, several thousand miles in some cases. So it's designed for specific things. The caterpillar has one thing to do, to grow, eat and grow. And the butterfly has several things to do eat, grow, fertilize, and mate. Thousands of years ago, Scripture declared what was common knowledge to everyone. For example, in the book of Job, chapter 12, we read, But now ask the beasts, 
and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? If we examine the evidence that we see, the various things that have been created, it is very clear from the scriptures that the evidence points to the reality that there is a Creator who has made all things. Our great Creator has provided us with countless examples of His infinite wisdom. The functionality and ingenuity of God's creatures surpass our understanding and our cause for unending thanksgiving and worship. While all creation reflects aspects of God's character, man alone was created in God's image. Man has physical distinctions. His brain is a masterpiece of complexity. His hands are able to accomplish precise work. His posture is upright. Yet, it is man's spiritual nature that is especially unique. Scripture explains that God is spirit. And even though mankind has fallen into sin, man's spiritual nature still retains a glimmer of the Creator's character. For example, man has a free will. Man knows the difference between good and evil. And only mankind has produced great scientists, composers, prophets, and poets. Mankind has been engineered with brilliant physical traits. For example, the human eye moves about 100,000 times each day with automatic focusing and can handle 1.5 million simultaneous messages. The eye is also self-cleaning with built-in wipers and cleaning fluid. And the eye even has the amazing ability to assemble and heal itself. Furthermore, God has designed the human eye to distinguish millions of colors and his mind to appreciate the rich spectrum of beauty seen throughout creation. Most people don't realize this, but the eye is part of the brain. It's an extension of bud in the embryo that buds off the brain. And there's a little window that develops in the skin called the cornea of the eye. Isn't that great? The eyeball is located precisely where a clear window develops in the skin, so we may look through. It's sensitive to light over a range of about 10 billion to 1. That is from the brightest uh, thing we can see, maybe a sun-drenched snowscape, uh, down to as little as a single photon of light. That's our smallest unit of light. And of course, everywhere you look, the focus is automatic. And the two eyes look at the same spot wherever we look. Uh, it's like somebody with a pair of six guns that can fire the guns, and everywhere they shoot, the two bullets make one hole instantly, everywhere. And that's what our eyes are doing. Everywhere we look, they converge in the same point. If they were off by just a degree or so, you'd see double. Everywhere I look, I see overwhelming evidence of the handiwork of God. And surely, when man denies that, he's without excuse, just as Romans chapter 1, verse 20 tells us. Even more mind-boggling, the Lord has designed all man's senses to be intimately integrated when we see food, our stomachs may growl and our mouths salivate. Upon hearing the voice of an old friend, our hearts may leap for joy. And one smell of grandma's cooking can invoke memories from years past. However, the wonder of our physical sophistication pales in comparison to our spiritual nature. Man is self-conscious and able to contemplate himself. Man was created a rational being, endowed with the faculty of reason and the ability to learn. Man was given the capacity to retain past experiences, and his memory makes it possible for him to reflect on the goodness of God. According to the Genesis record, man was made in the image of God. That means he had attributes, abilities, capacities that God had given him. When we read the Genesis 4 record, which is after the fall, we still see these abilities and capacities. For example, man could build cities. 
He could make and play musical instruments. He understood metallurgy. He understood agriculture. He could write poetry and literature. As well, man was created with a spiritual component. Man had a free will to choose, had a conscience. So we see God created man unique from the rest of the creation. There are many differences between mankind and animals. One verse that comes to mind is over in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It's the verse that says, we are special, that God has put eternity in our hearts. That is, we have a concept of history of the past and present and future. This is different from animals that live for today. We are a special creation. Another wonderful gift of the Creator to man is emotion. It gives him color and richness, feeling, and the capacity for joy and laughter. Only man of all creatures on earth can appreciate an inspiring symphony or rejoice in the beauty of a sunset. And man alone is a free moral agent, responsible to God and to society. The only explanation to account for morality in man is the fact revealed in the scriptures, namely, that man was created in the image of God and therefore made, like God, a moral being. In addition to being almighty and all-wise, the Bible states that God is completely holy. He always does what is right. God cannot lie, He cannot sin, and He is always faithful and true. How can we know that God is just? Scripture explains that the Lord has written His law on every heart. The Creator's holy nature is revealed to every man through conscience. Conscience is our God-given knowledge of right and wrong. Therefore, man knows that his Creator is both the moral lawgiver and the judge. Do you have a conscience? I believe I do have a conscience. Do you believe that everyone has a conscience? Absolutely. But do you have a conscience? Yes. Where did it come from? I don't know. The Bible makes it very clear that the knowledge of God is written on our hearts, even that uh, knowledge of right and wrong. Have you ever told a lie? Yes. All right, what does that make you? A liar. Liar, right? Have you ever stolen anything? Yes. What does that make you? A thief. A thief. Just supposing you're, you're, you're in a shop, in a store someplace, and there's something that you, you really need, and it's just sitting there and nobody's around watching it, you say to yourself, I haven't brought my wallet, forgot that. Nobody looking, in the pocket. And it goes in, you walk out, nobody challenges you and you got away with it. Inside, what are you thinking? At night, when you go to bed, what are you thinking? And I think anybody knows fully well that the thoughts will go round in the head, I stole that. This is a conscience. Have you always obeyed your God-given conscience? No. No. Have you ever used your Creator's name, God who gave you taste buds and eyesight and every good gift, ever used His name as a curse word? Yeah, I have. Jesus said, you've heard it said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you look at a girl lustfully, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked at a girl lustfully? Yeah. Okay, so you broke that commandment, right? Yeah. God says He has written His law in every human conscience. So they are all without excuse. Everyone knows that he's a sinner. Everyone knows he's broken God's laws. Everyone knows he hasn't done right. We have the ability to know right and wrong. If we have the ability to know what is good, then God also must know. He must be the, the ultimate creator. revelation of, of morality, of yeah. what's right, of what's good. Because how would we know what was right or wrong? Yeah, I know, it's that's him. amazing. The fact that every man knows right from wrong, okay. what does that tell us about God's character and nature? that he's just. If God were to judge based on the holy standard, would you be guilty or innocent? Guilty. So if you were guilty as a blaspheming, lying thief, on the day of judgment, would God send you to heaven or hell based on the Ten Commandments? 
uh, I would definitely go to hell. Do we have to face the Almighty Judge? And yes, we do. And that being so, we would be found guilty of whatever we've done. The conscience tells me there is someone to whom I am accountable. He is my creator. And I know that I have not lived up to his standards. Have you ever used God's name in vain, like, oh my God? Yeah. Can you think of a time your conscience just screamed at you? Something you did in the past where it's like, Alan, don't do that, or Alan, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. If you can remember that, do you think our Creator can? Yes. Right. You think conscience tells us we need a Savior? Yes. And you know that it took a, a, a God of personal love and concern, but of unbending justice. It's the only way it can be. We can't get him to change his laws. He's the only one who could have put that conscience within us so that we experienced. It's really God that we're experiencing uh, through our conscience. Though creation shows forth God's wonders, it presents a mixed message. For, in the midst of such beauty and order, we observe disease, decay, and death. Not surprisingly, it is the Bible alone which explains this apparent contradiction. In the beginning, God created everything perfect. However, man was given a free will and a choice. Sadly, he chose to rebel against his Creator. As God warned Adam, sin resulted in suffering and death. The curse described in Genesis affected all creation, and today we see the horrible results. However, there's good news. Before time began, God had a plan to rescue mankind. Because the penalty for sin is death, the Creator came to earth as a man, lived a sinless life, and died to pay the penalty for our sins. He then rose from the dead and offers forgiveness and eternal life to all who will trust Him. As this film has been portraying in the creation, we see the wisdom and power, the wonder of God, His concern for His creatures. But you can't look at it without realizing something's wrong. It's like we have a memory deep within our conscience of a time when there was a paradise, and it's lost. God made a beautiful world. It was perfect to start with. But because of man's sin, now it's a groaning world. So we see beauty, and we see groaning, and we see ugliness. Uh, but it all uh, seems contradictory, but that's only because it is a fallen world. It's so easy to see the God of wonders uh, just on a stroll through whatever neighborhood we might live in. Uh, you know, birds fluttering overhead, the majestic beauty of flowers, the, the glory of a sunset. And yet many of you may be troubled like I was as a young man, trained in biology. Well. What about all the birth defects, disease, disaster, fires, floods, famines, plagues? Where is God in all of these things? Is, is that the God of wonders who did that? The Bible tells us quite clearly, no. The God of wonders is the one who created the wonders we see, the marvels of, of beauty and design. Unfortunately, man rebelled against God. But what God did was absolutely phenomenal. Even though we rebelled against him and we don't deserve to even live, we don't deserve existence, he stepped into history to become one of us. Jesus said, God so loved the world, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Would you give your son, knowing that he's going to be hated and persecuted and scourged, beaten, mocked and crucified? God knew what would happen and I often think of Jesus. He knew from eternity past what he would face. Someone might wonder how a man who walked the dusty roads of uh, Israel so long ago could possibly uh, save us from death. How could he possibly raise us to new life? But remember, the Christ who died for us is the creator of life. 
What an awesome God, the fact that he would actually step into history to pay the penalty for our sin and then offer a free gift of salvation to save us from what we did. You see, in actuality, we committed high treason against the God of creation, and yet he loved us so much, he stepped into history to provide the payment for our sins so that we can spend eternity with him. Wow, what an awesome God. According to the scriptures, this great creator is the one who not only made everything, but who redeemed us from our sins. Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life in our place, died upon the cross, his blood was shed. Three days later, he's resurrected. He lives today. And whosoever believes in him and acknowledges him and acknowledges who we are and what we've done and asks for forgiveness and repent from our sins, can enter into a relationship with the Creator that will last for eternity. This is the good news. Perhaps the most wondrous of all the aspects of creation is that God would not leave us alone. He sent His own Son to restore things and we look forward to His coming again. When Once again, the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. They'll not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, but the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That marvelous passage in Isaiah. Wow, God's redeeming love. That's the greatest wonder of all. Truly, our Creator is the God of wonders. And the greatest wonder is His immeasurable love. Scripture states that God is love. And He demonstrated this love toward us by stepping down from heaven to offer His life so that we might be reconciled to Him forever. Jesus Christ is the Creator. On the cross, He bore our sins and then rose from the dead. The Lord now offers everlasting life to all who will turn from their sins and trust in Him personally. By placing your faith in Jesus Christ, you can enter into a relationship with the Creator of the universe that will last forever. This is His free gift and desire for you. To God alone, who does such great wonders, be glory, thanksgiving, and honor forever. The Lord of my soul, bless His holy, His wonderful name. Bless the Lord of my soul for His love will forever remain. Your Creator is worthy of praise. Your sustainer is poured out His grace. He poured out His mercy on those who would fear Him. He poured out His love, His forgiveness of sin. 